Not sure which chair, not sure which chair to sit in. I suppose that one. <laughs> Kate, the theme of the show is Game of Thrones. You seem to be dressed for the occasion. I am, I think. <laughs> Normal business wear for me. Develop, you're the defender of the game developers, you're standing, you're raising your sword for them? Exactly, I fight for the developers. So let's get right to the point. In, you recently released a game developer satisfaction survey, and the question that you're asking is, are developers in fact satisfied? Mm -hmm. And the conclusion that you seem to come to is, yeah. Um, developers are passionate, they more and more want to do this as their full-time career. So in that sense, they're satisfied, right? For the most part. Um, you know, we, we do this survey every year to basically gauge the, the notion our game developers as individuals, not as companies, but as individual developers working in this industry. Do they like their jobs? Do they like the working conditions? Do they like where the industry is going? Do they like the evolution of the technology? Do they like the evolution of game design and all those factors? And so when we ask this question every year, we try and gauge that, that general qualitative notion of satisfaction. And in general, yes, I mean, game developers, they are satisfied from the perspective that they are extremely passionate creative artists, because that's what they are, um, generating what they have always wanted to do. Um, you know, it is, it is a passion-driven industry. So they get to do what they want to do. They get to uh, create these amazing games, whether it's indie games, whether it's AAA, whatever it might be. Um, but at the same time, there's sort of a agony and the ecstasy aspect to this. So if you know that movie, the story of Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel, um, incredible passion, incredible skill, um, but also this incredible agony in terms of the effort that it takes to do it and the conditions under which you're doing it. And so there is something of a, a disconnect in terms of weighing that incredible passion and, and also seeing some of the, the things that developers have to put up with. Can you elaborate on the agony? Well, sure. I mean, one of the things that we all know um, very much about is crunch time. Um, it's something that we mention in this industry quite a bit. In fact, we sometimes mention it so much that we just stop mentioning it because it's just, well, that's just the way the industry is. And I think for creative industries, not just games, but film, television, other industries, you think about writers, you think about painters, there is a certain effort that goes into it, that goes beyond work hours. I mean, there's something about the creative passion behind it where you want to create the absolute best outcome, and especially when you're doing a collaborative project like game development where you, know, you want to put out the best product possible when the date hits. And I think for the most part, I mean, like a lot of artists, if you didn't have an actual date that you were shooting for, you'd probably iterate on that thing a hell of a lot longer than you are. Um, and sometimes if you're certain companies like Blizzard, that you have the freedom to just kind of iterate until you feel that it's, that it's ready to go. But not most companies don't have that freedom and certainly most developers don't have that freedom to do that. So you are up against a deadline and so you must work towards the deadline. Um, and so along with that, I mean, you're, that driving towards that deadline is driven by passion, but it also comes at a great cost. When you're seeing that, you know, a lot of people are working crunch time, like according to the survey, 17% of developers report that they work over 70 hours a week during crunch time. That's a lot of people, almost one out of five people in the industry working that amount. The even more alarming thing though is that almost 40% of developers report that they are uncompensated for that crunch time, which that's to me more, more of the serious issue. I mean, I, a lot of developers I think go into the industry, they go into their job realizing that there will be a certain amount of crunch, um, which again, in my view and in other industries outside of games, they usually call it poor project management. Well, we call it crunch, um, but if they go into it with that expectation, it would be nice if they also get expected that they, yeah, okay, fine, I'll work 70 hours a week, but I would like to get paid for my time. Well, it was a decade ago that we were talking about the EA spouse issue mm -hmm. and everything that surrounded that. Have things gotten any better in that time? Um, marginally better. I mean, we have seen over time that there has been less incidents of crunch. We've seen it decrease in terms of the number of times that developers do it and also the, the length of the period of when it actually happens. So it seems to be decreasing somewhat, um, but not by a huge margin. So compared to 10 years ago, it is marginally better, but it's not like drastically better. Okay. And when it comes to game developers who are having to work a lot of crunch, a lot of industries, 
I mean, other industries must be looking a lot better to them. It, they are, actually. I mean, there's a lot of cases where we know developers where they can take their skills, whether it's the artistic skills, program management skills, producer skills, programming, whatever, and they can make a determination, say, you know what, I can go get a job at a, a software company, not a games company, but some other company in the IT sector, and oftentimes they will go to these companies, which all, a lot of whom actually have a lot more perks than a lot of game development companies do. And um, so you look at the Googles and the Facebooks and all these companies like that where they've got these incredible packages for their employees. Now, it's not to say that those companies are without intense work hours because they tend to have their own issues with that. But um, at least there seems to be a little bit more fair compensation for it. But the, of course, the great cost in that is that you can go to one of these companies and you probably, for the most part, I mean, part of it's a personal choice as well, whether you want a work-life balance or not, um, and of course we see that in the demographics. The younger you are, the te you know you tend to w be able to work more, both physically. You have got the stamina to stay up all night for days on end, um, but also there's just that desire, you know, to just pour your heart into it. You're starting out in the industry. You want to, you know, do the best you can. Um, but you can go to these other companies and take advantage of the better work-life balance. But of course, you're not working on games. Yeah, that's kind of the thing, isn't it? It's, uh, game developers, they want to work on games, they want to be creative, mm -hmm. they're artistic. But what can publishers do to make sure that it's not just pure passion that is keeping these developers working on these games? Well, I, I think there's several things that developers need, or publishers need to do. Um, you know, one of the most important things, I think, is being transparent. Um, if you're going to join our company, and I think more and more companies have been following this path, but I think we could do better in this industry as a whole. So when you see developers, I mean, when developers are coming to the company, just be upfront. We work, we tend to work X amount of crunch. And most companies can quantify this. They can look back on their data over the last few years and say, you know what, on average, we end up working about 20% extra time. Um, so you should know that coming into this. Um, we also will or will not compensate you for that time, which is usually the part that's not mentioned. Um, and so it's important to be upfront and transparent about it. And, um, and I think to some degree, more and more companies are trying to be, but at the same time, there's a certain amount of desperation that we have a project that has to get done. We don't have time to deal with this. Let's just get a body in there, get them to work and get moving. Um, and a lot of times you're able to do that. Why? Because you've got people who are incredibly passionate about making games and they will do anything to get a job in the industry, even sacrifice work-life balance. And so we see that happening a lot, and it happened 10 years ago with the EA spouse issue, and we really haven't seen it that much different today. Shifting gears a little bit, um, when, it comes to, when it came to finding a new job, mm -hmm. developers listed having creative freedom, the ability mm -hmm. to have some degree of autonomy while working on the games as their number one, like most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, are they getting that with developers for the most part? I think for a lot of them feel that they are um, for the most part. I mean, what's interesting is that when you look at, when we ask developers like what country by name or country, company by name would you like to work for? And for the last few years, Valve is number one. Um, and I think part of that is because Valve has um, publicly shown, like through their employee handbook that was released some time ago, um, that we are a culture that values that kind of individual input and creativity, and they just kind of exemplified, whether it's real or perceptual, doesn't matter. It's the fact that developers perceive that a company like Valve, some of the others high on the list, like BioWare is another one, um, where these companies are, are uh, giving the developers enough enough room to express their creative freedom, but also consistently very high, like on last year's developer survey, the number two answer after Valve was my own company. And we're seeing that trend very, very heavily increase, and that's not a surprise to any of us in this room, because we know that indie development is, is very quickly growing. Um, and it's not just growing in terms of professional indie development. We're also seeing the rise of the hobbyist developer as well. So we're seeing more and more cases where now that the game development tools are free, or um, and the education for them is cheap, or at least you can educate yourself online, like go on YouTube or something, and for those self-learners, um, we know of cases where people who are professional accountants and they go home at night and they make games for, as a hobby, and they're totally fine with that. They don't want to be a game developer, but they love making games. When it comes to actually being able, uh, a lot of the times it's like, if you don't like the crunch of working with the publisher, 
you can always go into indie development mm -hmm. to make your own games and have that kind of autonomy. But being an indie developer really isn't that much easier, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a high stakes thing. You could fail or succeed on a single game. Right. And you're working just as hard in a lot of ways. I mean, right. the creators of Retro City Rampage, for example, said mm -hmm. that he nearly had a physical breakdown working on these kinds of games. So right. it's kind of like, you're never going to really find an escape. Making a game is hard. Right, well, the, diff the huge difference there is self-determination. That's the key. It's like, so yeah, I know a lot of people who have left in a, you know, a large publishing environment that was very intense and it was, uh, you know, very, you know, a lot of crunch and whatnot. They went on to become an indie developer because for two reasons, they can have their creative freedom, 100% creative freedom, and they also, if they want to crunch, that's, it, it's in their own hands. It's basically, they're the one cracking their own whip at themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not having someone else do it for them. Um, or at them, I should say. And so that, that is a huge difference to your psyche. It's a huge difference to your mentality. It's like, I will, I'm willing to stay up all night to get this code done for my game, for my creative vision, because that's what I want to do, as opposed to, I have to do this. And it might even be in a company environment on a game that they don't really like working on. You know, but it's a job, and they're, they're, you know, they're thankful for the job, but it may not be the ideal type of genre or type of game that they want to work on. So you get that creative freedom by being indie. And yes, for most indies I know, they're, they don't have much work-life balance. But it's how, I don't know how much different that is than the painter who gets a loft somewhere and basically stays up three days straight painting their masterpiece on canvas, and then they sleep for three days. One thing that I've observed both in the industry and actually in the games press where I am, is that a lot of people hit their 30s, they kind of age out of the industry, you could say. Mm -hmm. They have families, they get tired of the games in general. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a real problem, this kind of this burnout or this aging out. Is this something that you're observing on your side? And if that's the case, like, what can we do about it? Well, part of, it, part of it is just a maturity as we as human beings, I mean, we, we advance in our careers and some people find out that working that kind of schedule is not what they want. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people leave the industry. I mean, a lot of people when, in our survey, when we ask them, they leave because of the working conditions. Um, and it's also interesting to note that when we ask them, what do you think are the most, what are the top reasons that affect the public's perception of the game industry in a negative way? Now, you would expect it to be something like, perceived connection with violence or something like that, or perceived connection with obesity. And those do show up on the list, but the number one reason they report are working conditions, which is interesting because you would not expect the public to necessarily know what those working conditions are. Um, but that is a reason why a lot of people transition out of the game industry. Either they get burned out by the kind of content they're working on or the kind of genre they're working on. Um, they're just not seeing the innovation that they would hope, um, or, or they get the opportunity to work on something they really want to work on. Um, and I know a lot of people who do that. They work on a project they were passionate about. They couldn't find something that aligned with their interests as a creative person. So they kind of drifted out of the game industry and eventually a few years later came back when the opportunity arose. And um, so we are seeing that to some degree where people kind of age out. And, um, and that's, of course, different from ageism, which is a whole other topic. Uh I'm perceiving, there's a tension that I'm perceiving between a desire for publishers to create a commercial product mm -hmm. and developers to create something meaningful and artistic. Right. And it seems to be an even greater tension than you would see in other industries because, mm -hmm. I, fair or not, a lot of games um, are seen as commercial products, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're here at GamesBeat, we're talking about monetization strategies and how to capitalize on mobile games. Mm -hmm. like. I mean, that, that tension is, is very real. And yes. I mean, would you say that it's probably a lot stronger in the games industry than elsewhere? Um, not having worked in film or, or other industries, I can't say for certain, but I know that the tension is there mm -hmm. and it's pretty palpable. Um, you've got a situation where you have game developers who, um, you know, it, it really comes down to that art versus commerce argument. And, um, and that's why we are seeing the ability with, with indie, indie development, it's kind of allowing more developers to drift towards the side of art, even though yes, they wanna make money off what they're producing, but still a lot of them do it more for the artistic value with the hope of making money as opposed to making money with the hope of maybe doing art for the project they're working on in a big company. And there is, that's kind of the major difference between those two scenarios. And, um, 
you know, and I, I think we will see more and more, and we, we've started to see it to some degree, where there are developers out there who make games purely for artistic value. They have no intention of selling them. They just make something that they think is creative and cool, and they put up online, and they just want to see how people react to it, in much the way some artists would do something, uh, performance art, a painting, or whatever. Um, but the ability to, to generate income off of it, I mean, yeah, you've kind of got the the industry machine part of it, which is the money-making commerce part of it, that's the industry, and then you've got the side that's more of like the artistic expression aspect of the game industry. And I think for the longest time, those have been melded together as sort of like the same thing, but in my view, they're not. Um, you know, and there's a reason why in uh, politics is often reacted to games as if games are toys, not are artistic, you know, not something of artistic value. So like when they see a game that creates a negative reaction to the public, like it has something in the game like Grand Theft Auto or something that they think is offensive from a political standpoint, they like to regulate it as if it's like a frisbee that every time you throw it, it comes back and hits you on the head. And that's broken. That needs to be regulated and taken off the market. And so that's, that's changing, fortunately. My final question is kind of what is the biggest challenge going forward that the industry faces in keeping developers satisfied and perhaps more importantly, keeping its most, its biggest talent because, I mean, we are in Silicon Valley right now. Uh, the tech bubble shows no signs of bursting mm -hmm. and game developers like EA are competing directly with yep. the Googles and the Apples of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest challenge, first and foremost, is going to be the working conditions issue. I mean, this industry, as part of its maturity as an industry, and, and that's one of the things I think the industry needs to own up to, is one of my frustrations is oftentimes this industry, as powerful as it is as an economic force and a cultural force these days, I don't think we always live up to that. You know, I mean, and you can evidence that by some of the ways that, like, even, you know, you go to a city, they have a film office to try and attract films to come and, you know, set up and do a production in their, in their city, and, um, but they don't do much for game development. I mean, that's, that's changing, more and more, it's changing. But, um, I, so we as an industry, I think we need to address the working conditions issues head on. Um, in much the same way over the past year because of certain incidents that have happened online. We're dealing with the diversity issue very much head on now as it, um, in a very you know, clear, top-down, constructive way. And I think the working conditions one is one that we have to face as an industry and say, you know what, if we want to mature, if we want to retain talent because those other non-game companies are going to keep sprouting up. And then you've even got competition from things like SpaceX and some of the other um, technical industries out there. I mean, SpaceX shows up with a booth that GDC, why? Because they're trying to recruit game developers for their projects. So there's a lot of competition, so I think we need to really address some of these issues if we want to keep our talent. All right, Kate Edwards, thank you, and keep raising your sword to defend the industry. I will. I will. Thank you.